This is CBC Vancouver News. To be flexible around addressing problem tenants uh, and to be uh, a firm around addressing problem landlords. The Premier unveils big changes for renters and landlords in BC's tight housing market. Will they work? Plus. Just have to leave and UBCO is not taking any responsibility and that is so wrong on so many levels. Dozens of people who call an assisted living apartment home in Kelowna have been ordered to leave because of a nearby university project. And hey, uh, hey, uh. housing renewal. And we're hoping to uh, house 20 people, 20 families. 10 homes set to be torn down are being given new life for families on the Sunshine Coast. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. Listen up if you are a renter or a landlord in BC. The province is rolling out some major changes meant to protect renters and try to cut down on hikes and evictions. As Mira Baines explains, some landlords are also looking for more protections. Premier David Eby says the new legislation will address how some landlords evict tenants, in some cases in bad faith. What we're seeing is some landlords using the personal use exemption, saying, hey, I'm going to use this suite, uh, evicting somebody, uh, and then living there briefly, and then moving in somebody at a higher rent rate. Under the new changes, the personal use exemption will require the landlord to use it for 12 months, not six months, and a landlord will have to submit an online declaration that can be tracked and audited. For purpose-built rentals like apartment buildings, landlords will be banned from evicting tenants for their own personal use, which the Premier says has been affecting vulnerable seniors. This bill attempts to uh, close loopholes that both sides have used uh, to be flexible around addressing problem tenants uh, and to be uh, a firm around addressing problem landlords and illegal evictions. EB also brought up the recent case of a woman who had a baby and her rent went up by $600 because she added a new tenant. Under the new legislation, if a renter adds a person under 19 to the household, the landlord will not be able to significantly increase the rent. For some people looking to rent, they're skeptical. But this is uh, providing that the landlords are going to comply with, with this. There's nothing, there's no teeth, there's no teeth. For landlords resolving disputes such as dealing with problem tenants who haven't paid rent or damaged property, the process at the residential tenancy branch has improved, according to the housing minister. For unpaid rent cases, we've created a new expedited process and we're seeing 57% drop in uh, wait times for unpaid rent, which is substantial and very important. Still, a landlord's group based in Surrey says that's not enough to help people struggling with people who damage their property or use drugs and refuse to leave. We, we have the protection for the landlords. So, okay, if they are concerned about the bad eviction, but uh, the landlords are also worried about the bad tenants. Landlords are also frustrated with the tenancy law, which is going to be misused by the tenants a number of uh, there are some concerns corporations will take over even more rentals despite the new legislation. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. In Kelowna, dozens of people in an assisted living apartment have been ordered to leave their homes. It's because of a, because of a UBC construction project causing shifting ground. Brady Strachan is more from those forced out. So there's one here. Just looking at the visible cracks on the outside wall of Jennifer Elaine's apartment building, it's no wonder she's feeling stressed about the stability of her home. And these have gotten bigger since uh, last week. Elaine is one of more than 80 residents in this assisted living building who learned over the weekend they have to pack up and leave. I was just sick. I literally, I, my physical well-being and my mental well-being has really declined. The apartment building is just meters away from a massive construction project in Kelowna where UBC Okanagan's downtown campus is being built with a 43-story tower as the centerpiece. The $263 million project is currently in the excavation phase, but that work has caused ground shifting, more than city planners had expected. So far, four surrounding buildings have been impacted with cracks in the structures forming last fall. 
The city has maintained the apartment building was safe for residents, but all that changed over the weekend. We consulted with some of our technical experts, and unfortunately what we come to the conclusion was it was at the point and there's been enough movement and enough risk with the building that we needed to step in and put in an order for an evacuation of the building. Residents have until 6 o'clock Tuesday evening to leave. They are being put up in hotels for now. Paul Thomas says it's very stressful for him and his partner. Uh, we just have to leave, and UECO is not taking any responsibility, and that is so wrong on so many levels. They are absolutely the cause of everything. Meanwhile, work on the site has been paused as engineers try to determine a way forward. This downtown Kelowna campus construction project is being managed by UBC Properties Trust, a private corporation owned by UBC. When contacted, the company refused to answer questions from CBC News, saying that all public statements should come from the university itself. As for UBC Okanagan, the university says the last thing it wants to do is cause impacts to its future neighbours. I am concerned. Um, UBC... UBCO is only as good as its community and its relationship to the community, I think. And uh, we are going to have to work to maintain that and, and get back some of that trust. There's no question. There is no estimated date for when the residents will be able to return, which leaves them sitting on the sidelines as they worry about the stability of the building they live in. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna. Ten homes in Port Moody, meanwhile, are about to begin an epic journey. They were to be torn down, but will now be moved by barge to the Sunshine Coast. As Michelle Gassoub reports, it's a plan that hopes to save old buildings for families waiting for critical housing. Hey, uh, hey, uh. Members of the Shisha Nation singing in celebration in front of one of ten homes destined for their community on the Sunshine Coast. These houses in Port Moody were meant to be demolished. Instead, they face a journey by truck, then barge, down the Fraser River, all the way up to Seashelt. We're hoping to uh, house 20 people, 20 families uh, in a short period of time, which normally would have, you know, take, like I've said, you know, 18 to 24 months if it was stick builds. Um, so everybody is very excited about it. You know, they, they can't wait. There's a lot of chatter. The houses will be renovated to be more energy efficient and given basements so that extended families can live together. The Shisha Nation is facing a housing shortage with hundreds of people waiting for homes like these ones. The houses were identified by Renewal Development, which has transported structures before, including a yellow schoolhouse that was moved via barge last summer. Demolition should be the last option, not the first. And as we're proving today, there is a very viable alternative and a responsible alternative, which is to physically rescue, relocate and repurpose many more of these homes. Every year, 2,700 single family homes are demolished across Metro Vancouver. Lewis says with a housing shortage and sky high construction costs, government should be providing incentives to save more structures. This is a program that we are very interested in. I know that they just received funding from CMHC to expand some of the work they're doing. We're looking at how we can potentially partner with them. The previous owners of this house, who lived here for 30 years, say they'll watch tonight as the place they lived in is driven away. It was just a wonderful neighbourhood, a wonderful home, and I'm so glad that it is going to someone else. Um, and it'll see that life instead of being demolished. They plan on making the trip to Seashelt to see the place their house will make its new home. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Port Moody. New legislation is aiming to allow First Nations in B.C. more rights in buying and managing land. If passed, the amendments to the Property Law Act and the Land Title Act will include First Nations among the legal entities that can buy, hold and sell land. Right now, most First Nations cannot do this in their own names. Instead, they have to set up a corporation or ask individual members to handle the purchase. The racist and the colonial laws are finally aligning with the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, allowing our Indigenous peoples to hold these lands. 
Withholding the ability to buy and sell land has meant that many First Nations have been left out of decision making on how land is used. A heads up for drivers and commuters, the Massey Tunnel will be closed overnight for four nights starting this Thursday for counterflow upgrades. The tunnel will be closed overnight from Thursday to Sunday. The northbound lanes will be shut from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., while the southbound lanes will be closed from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. on the first two days, then 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. over the weekend. Emergency vehicles and late-night buses can still use the tunnel if they have an escort vehicle. Vancouver's legendary Nat Bailey Stadium is set to get an upgrade. To continue to try and improve the experience for players, for the MLB affiliates, and most importantly for the fans. So that's all the things that we're keeping in mind as we try and bring this historic ballpark into a brand new era. Among the changes will be an indoor facility built along the right field side to replace the current barbecue picnic area. Players will be able to use it as a batting area, and fans can watch games from that rooftop of the building. It's not clear yet, though, when all the upgrades will be finished. The Vancouver Canadians begin their season at the Nat on April 9th and hope to repeat as Northwest League champions this year. Hockey playoffs have begun, meanwhile, not just in the NHL, but in the Western Hockey League. One team hoping to go far is the Prince George Cougars. After years of struggle, the team recently won their first WHL Western Conference title. And earlier tonight, they defeated Spokane 4-2. Before the game, we spoke with the CBC's Andrew Kuryata in Prince George. Doing really well. They've uh, had uh, two games so far in their playoff series against Spokane. It's been 6-1 and 7-4, so pretty good leads. And that's just kind of indicative of how this team has been doing all season. Now, just to get a little bit of backstory, like you said, this is the first time that they've ever won the Western Conference in the WHL, which is just below the NHL, kind of a feeder league. A lot of the players go on there. But it has been, this is the 30th season for the Cougars. Uh, and in the last two decades they have either been eliminated in the first round of the playoffs or not even made it to the playoffs every year except for once they've never advanced beyond the second round um so this team though this is just a really historic one uh they have been winning uh not just the league they've won the province they've broken their all-time win streaks they have two players on the team who have uh set franchise records for all-time points uh, for the team overall and again just to really emphasize it was like maybe five years ago there was some serious talk of is this team gonna have to fold and leave because people just aren't coming out to see them because if there's not a winning team it's kind of hard to get bums in seats but uh now there's uh just sellout crowds really great atmosphere um i i went to i, I went to uh a game this weekend but i also went to the final <laughs> game of the season when they cemented uh, their place at the top of the league. And I spoke to a longtime fan. She's been a season ticket holder uh, since the start. This is Betty June Gare, and she spoke to me uh, just before that game started. I know one year, uh, we, were, we just made it to the, uh, not you the year, but we just made it in the playoffs. And uh, we had to uh, beat, uh, we had to play Everett, and they had Constantine as the coach. So we thought, uh oh. So she, she never lost faith and she believes that this team is going to beat all those past odds and go all the way. Uh, there's game three tonight in Spokane and we'll find out. A lot of people will be cheering. As the NHL playoffs approach, Canuck fans gear up for an exciting postseason. After the break, though, why gambling experts are concerned. Stick around. Thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. We have some sad news in Canada's comedy scene. Comedian and writer Joe Flaherty has died. His daughter confirmed his death after a short illness. Flaherty was well known for his roles on SCTV as well as Freaks and Geeks. Magda Gabra Salase has more on his lasting legacy. And this is the SCTV News. Joe Flaherty was part of a Canadian SCTV classic. A founding Joe member of SCTV, the beloved sketch comedy show, he played Floyd Robertson, a parody of a news anchor. Guy Caballero, the fictional owner of SCTV, and the vampire Count Floyd. Time for another monster, chiller, horror theater. 
Dave Thomas was among former SCTV castmates that spoke with Flaherty last week. Joe was kind of the godfather of SCTV. Joe was always there in the background, um, pulling the strings, initiating things, making things happen. Flaherty was born in Pittsburgh. He did improv at the Second City in Chicago before bringing his comedic talent to Toronto, working alongside Martin Short. So he was a great teacher, he was a great director, and he was a great co-worker and a great friend. After SCTV, Flaherty appeared in a number of TV shows, including Freaks and Geeks. Shouldn't you be doing your homework? Me. And on the big screen, perhaps his most memorable role. You will not make this putt, you jackass. Playing a heckler in Happy Gilmore alongside Adam Sandler. Sandler called Flaherty a genius of a comedian and a true sweetheart. His kindness is something his colleagues at Toronto's Humber College remember too. He taught comedy there for years. I was amazed by how compassionate and open Joe was with all the people who were auditioning. They knew he was terrifically talented, but that's when I realized that he had this whole other realm to him, which was as a kind of mentor and an instructor. Flaherty was a family man as well, a father of two. Joe Flaherty was 82 years old. Magda Gebrezalasa, CBC News, Toronto. With the Vancouver Canucks clinching their spot in the NHL playoffs, those who enjoy sports betting have a few more reasons to place a wager if they want to, but some say that is not a good thing. Earlier this year, CBC's Marketplace team looked at seven NHL and NBA teams and found that gambling messages filled up 21% of each broadcast, reflecting the growing push for fans to take part. And while it's not just fans, athletes are generally trusted to stay far away from the gambling scene, but Toronto rapper Jay Jonte Porter and LA Dodgers star pitcher Shohei Otani are both currently involved in betting scandals. For more on this, we're now joined by Luke Clark, the director of the Center for Gambling Research at UBC. Luke, thanks for joining us. First of all, this NHL season, exceptionally exciting for Canucks fans, feeling a bit starved. Not everyone can feel compelled to put money on the line how do, though, people get drawn into sports betting, at, uh, at least initially? Uh, yeah, the, the main motives for, um, uh, you know, across all forms of gambling are uh, a desire and a, a, a need to win money and a drive for excitement and, and, and coping with uh, low mood and anxiety. But in the, in the case of sports betting, um, we also see the, the involvement in sport itself, the, the, the fandom, uh, as an important factor there. So for people who follow a particular sport or in a particular league, there's a tendency to see betting as um, a way to use that knowledge and maybe an easy way to make money. Uh, and of course, the reality uh, is very different that they're, they're betting against a bookmaker who has huge amounts of data at their, at their disposal to set the odds. R explain to us what in-play betting is and how that has changed the pace of gambling. Yeah, modern sports betting has um, changed um, quite quite dramatically uh, as an activity over the last couple of years. This is since uh, the federal bill that came in, in in 2021 in Canada, although in other parts of the world it's, it's existed for for, um, uh, for longer than that. Um, 
and uh, you know, the the, the in-play betting uh, or, or live betting here is a shift where previously gamblers would mainly bet on the, the outcome of a match before it started. Now it's possible to bet after a match has begun and to bet repeatedly um, throughout the match uh, on you know, what's going to happen next, uh, who's going to score the next goal. So this all um, speeds up the pace of the, uh, the, the game and it becomes much easier to bet impulsively and to chase losses. What does your center's research say about gambling ads? Uh, who do they impact the most? Yeah, from the research internationally, there's a, there's a lot of evidence that um, gambling advertising and exposure to ads is linked to intentions to gamble, is linked to positive attitudes towards gambling uh, and actual gambling. Um, there are there are two slightly different pieces to to the psychology behind advertising. For for people who are already gambling regularly, um, these ads contain a lot of learned associate associations. They're um, uh, they're full of uh, of triggers that can elicit craving. So you know you can imagine someone in recovery from a gambling problem who's trying to watch televised sports and they're bombarded by these cues. And then the second concern would be around uh, youth who uh, are maybe below the legal age to gamble, but are attracted to gambling through um, the, uh, the marketing. Right. Lou Clark, the director of the Center for Gambling Research at UBC, thanks you for joining us. We appreciate your expertise. Thank you, Dan. There is a live shot of a glowing science world uh, in False Creek. We get a bit of everything on the south coast before we tilt to the sun. Darius will have your BC wide weather forecast right after this. Dante Giammaroli plays a lot of hockey. It's been that way for the 15-year-old since he was five. But at this practice, he's the only one on the team who's considered legally blind with only 7% of his vision. Using my peripheral vision for seeing the puck and uh, quite often it can be deceiving for a lot of players like opponents. The teen was born with a genetic disorder that's led to his eyesight deteriorating since he was young. It's affected his mother and younger brother as well. It was never something that we let slow us down. Um, I made sure that my boys had every opportunity uh, available to them. Giammarioli makes the pass. Giammarioli shoots and scores! And it definitely hasn't slowed the team down. Last weekend in Toronto, he lit up Blind Hockey Canada selection games and was invited to join the national team the youngest player to ever be added to the roster. If I wasn't blind, I wouldn't have this opportunity to, you know, play on the blind hockey national team, get to know all these people that also are blind, just get to, you know, build relationships with those people. He's considered, you know, one of the top players in the world. From there on, like, there was no worries anymore. There was no feeling bad. He knew he had done something and accomplished something that even his teammates growing up will, are not likely to accomplish. So we're still very proud of him for that. For now, he'll be preparing to make his national team debut against the U.S. in St. Louis in two weeks, finding a place in a different version of a sport he's played since he was a kid. With blind hockey, I'll always have that opportunity to play no matter what my vision's like. It. it provides a sense of assurance that I'll still be able to function and be great. Adjusting to losing his eyesight has taught GM Maroli a resiliency uncommon for many his age, on and off the ice. Travis McEwen, CBC News, Edmonton.
Hey, I'm Rohit Joseph. Vibin is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. Stream Vibin on CBC Listen. A decades-old mystery was recently unearthed at a construction site in Penticton. A backhoe dug up an ancient wallet. The workers stepped in and they made a co connection to the original owner. We spoke with both the worker who found the wallet and the owner's widow. Have a look. <laughs> We're gonna go get the wallet. Are you ready for this? Yeah. yeah. Roger's wallet. <laughs> well, it's, it's got his name yeah. stamped right here, eh? The operator was just literally peeling back the soil. As he peeled back, the, I guess the wallet unfolded. Didn't look like it was dirt or a rock, so I had to go investigate. So I grabbed my shovel and went and cleaned off the dirt. I noticed it had a name in it. We find a lot of things in the ground, but at the end of the day, nothing really has a name or a meaning to it, right? So I, I thought, well, what the heck, I'll see if I can find this guy. And that's how the kind of the journey started. When I heard about it, um, I said to Danny, we have to go. I have to meet that gentleman, you know, we have to go, we owe it to dad. He, he was always a firm believer that you never leave a, jo a, a job undone. So right. he always saw it to the end. And this is the ending of that job because <laughs> his wallet was still there, so he had to get it. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, Call Direct by Furnace, installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. Time for our BC Wide Weather Forecast with Darius Madavi and a map that looks very different from when it used to. Which is good. Mm -hmm. I think it's good. Uh, for the only the second day that they've been doing it, uh, they resumed releasing the fire danger map uh, yesterday, April 1st, and it will run now until November once again. So the uh, the break is over. You have to look at this map again. Uh, for now, nothing too uh, notable, just the fact that they are releasing it again, but I'm sure we'll be seeing this uh, more in the, the weeks to come. Uh, at the moment, not much to, to, to take away from it. We do have some pockets of moderate and even a tiny bit of high fire danger. Uh, but for now, just monitoring the situation. No extreme weather on the way as far as uh, it, it looks so far. So nothing to worry about too much in terms of the fire. Uh, and we do actually have some precipitation on the way. Temperatures are dropping. So if anything, the fire danger will decline. We have some scattered showers and flurries going to continue. You can see that cloud moving in across the province, especially the southern parts of the province on Thursday, clearing out in the north, but coming down here. Uh, originally, our clouded day was going to be Friday, but now it seems to have shifted earlier to Thursday. Maybe a bit of sun still in the morning, but for now it looks like we're getting cloudier and cloudier on Thursday as our forecast, so don't expect too much. Uh, today we did have uh, still very warm temperatures throughout the southern BC, southern interior hitting 20 degrees in many places. Uh, tomorrow, a bit of a change. We're going to see those temperatures drop in many cases back down into the, uh, the single digits here on the coast, uh, but not looking like it'll be uh, cool for too long. Temperatures start to come up again in the days ahead. Uh, it's just that cold front passing through that dropped our temperatures, but by the end of this week, back up to around 14, 15 degrees, so not looking too shabby. Uh, conditions tomorrow, still we're seeing those scattered showers, those flurries going to continue in the interior as that front passes through, leaving unsettled conditions in its wake. But in the meantime, here in Vancouver, we get that overcast morning tomorrow, but then clearing up as that rain finishes off, morning showers give way to a mix of sun and cloud, and that's the story for the rest of the week, Dan. Okay, Darius, thanks very much. Thank you. And that is your late news for Tuesday. Thank you for joining us tonight. For news at any hour, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1 that begins tomorrow morning at 5.30. Have a good night.